Alan, this is Mark. Good afternoon. Hey, Coach. Thanks for uh, calling in. Yeah, we really appreciate it. Hey, you guys are doing an awesome job. You can feel your passion and your interest, and I think that's going to, you know, really go a long way in, in being a platform for these kids and giving them, uh, them the opportunity to, you know, to express themselves on the field. Uh, well, we really appreciate it, Coach, and we're really looking forward to that for sure for 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 the league to really be a, a place for players to showcase themselves, be themselves, for the coaches to inject their personalities into the teams. We're already seeing that, and uh, let's get right into that really with, with the XFL. What was the most appealing thing about the XFL that helped you make the decision to join the league? Well, I think two things. Number one was, uh, you know, Oliver's passion and experience and knowledge of what it takes to get it done. But then basically, you know, the more you get into it, the more you realize that you're just starting in a garage. You know, you're starting with nothing, no, no staff, no, no personnel department, no players, and you get to build it from scratch and not have to do it quickly, uh, but do it mindfully and do it, uh, you know, analytically to some degree uh, and, and taking it step by step and not having the pressures of getting it done so fast that the, the quality of work that you put into it is diminished. Well, really, Coach, I mean, there's some very new and unique ways that the league's doing these types of things. One thing we saw was the, the phase draft, right, the phase format. What did you think about that going into the draft, the different phases and the draft orders and all that? Well, I thought it was awesome. I mean, when you think about it logically, which has been thought through, you know, collectively by by Oliver and the, and the people up in Stanford and the coaches is that, we're starting with with no players. We're starting with no needs, and so the way the draft was set up by by skill positions, as you well know, in in different phases, allowed the teams to put together uh, the, the, their sides of the ball in a mindful way that they they wanted to, yet uh, you know not be so specific that we were we were you know overlapping different positions and different sides of the ball, which I think would have been confusing to everybody involved. How much did you rely? I mean, the scouting uh, had to be immense going into that draft. It was a jumbo draft, 70 players plus the quarterbacks. How much did you rely on the data from the summer showcases, your own scouting, and how much more scouting of your own team now that you have a roster do you have left to go? Uh, that, that's a great question. So, well, number one, we just started with the AAF. We started with the players that we felt would, would probably in the pool in the AAF, and we evaluated them first. And we got that done relatively early in the process once our staff uh, came together. Um, and that eliminated a lot of, lot of players out of the pool because we did all of them. Uh, and we had experience in the AEF, not only in our personnel department, but, but throughout our staff. So that really helped. And that minimized uh, the project of evaluating the other players that were in the pool and the recent players that have come out of practice squads and so forth. So, you know, credit goes to... Uh, you know, Josh Hinch, our DPP, and, and Justin Hickman and our personnel department and our coaches all were a part of the process. So, you know, very similar maybe to the Cincinnati Bengals where their coaches are heavily involved in the scouting process as much as any, any team in the, in the NFL. And, and uh, we did it ourselves, and our, our coaches were awesome. Our coordinators, uh, you know, did a great job through the organization of it. And then, you know, the, the, the use of, you know, virtual – uh, community and, and, and getting on, uh, you know, calls uh, virtually through our computers helped us, you know, our, with our staff meetings and our personnel evaluation. So it was a, it was a group effort, no doubt about it. And we, now that we've got our team, you know, we've, we've done a, a, a good job of evaluating our draft. We're, we're proud of what we've done. We've got players we want to coach uh, that we know extremely well. And now we get a chance to meet them for the first time uh, in December. Well, you talk about some of the interesting moves you made during the draft. In, in phase one, round one, you were the only team to take a tight end, Nick Truesdale, right? What stood out about him? Because a lot of people saw the move as a tight end and were a little surprised, but I'm sure that, I mean, you saw him and you're like, we have to have him in that first round. Well, we we based a lot of it on you know how many the, the volume of tight ends that, that were there. We, we certainly wanted to start that way, and we just – you know, we just did our own kind of individual analytics, nothing overly scientific, but if we were going to get the quality tight end that we needed to have and wanted in, in our locker room, not only as a player, but as a person, and as a leader, you know, we felt a good place to start with, was with Nick. And I'm, I'm sure your quarterbacks are really going to appreciate having a quality tight end coach. And you got two quality quarterbacks in Aaron Murray and, and then Taylor Cornelius, you draft. 
will will Taylor be able to compete for the starting quarterback job once you uh, you know get into camp come December and January? Well, we expect him to. I mean, we expect any player getting reps to uh, to be competing, and uh, obviously we've brought Aaron in, uh, you know, as our designated quarterback that we went out and and uh, encouraged the league to to bring to us, which they did. Uh, but you know, Aaron's not going to get all the reps. Taylor certainly will, and you know, you guys have followed his background and what he did in one year at Oklahoma State is really a credit to him, not only on the field, but they, you know, they elected him captain. Uh, before the start of the season, that's that goes a lot not only to his talent, but as to his leadership ability. And and he's gonna he's gonna uh, you know people in our locker room are gonna take notice of him on the field as they will uh, with with Vincent Testaverde and as they will with uh, Quentin Flowers, who although he's played running back the last two years in Cincinnati, will be a part of our quarterback room as well. Yeah, you you got a lot of special players looking at your draft, coach, and I know you have a lot of experience with roster limitations and fluidity having coached in the cfl do you anticipate needing to have that kind of depth and knowledge of your roster the way you did up north in the xfl well i think that uh, one of the issues up north is obviously because of the ratio there's this constant movement of players throughout the course of the week i mean the beauty of the roster is is the best players are going to play and uh, when our guys walk into the locker room you know in plant city in december and start getting on the field, they're going to recognize that uh, there's going to be competition at every level, every position on our team, including the, in, the, uh, in the kicking department. So, you know, we're excited about that. We're excited about the guys we brought in, uh, the people that they are and the talent that they have and the competition that they're going to bring, uh, not only on, on an individual side of the ball, but once we start practicing against each other. And with with the new, the new rules, the reimagining of the game, as we've talked about with the XFL, how much experimentation offensively do you anticipate? How do you approach the risk associated with that? Trying to take advantage of new rules and a new style of play, but also, you know, wanting to go out there and play good crisp football, as we always say on our show that Oliver Luck loves to say. Uh, but you do have the, the opportunity to get to get, you know, have some interesting play calling in this league. How do you how do you approach that balance? Yeah, I think that uh, you know there there is no real balance to that. The the the, the quality of play is going to come by playing efficient football, throwing it in the normal sense as people will see the week before, and running it in the normal sense the way the people will see the week before. I mean, that's the way it's going to start. And certainly, there's some nuances that go along with it. But the focus is going to be smart football, efficient football. You know, being playing quality football in all three phases giving the fans a game that they, they can recognize. And then, you know, obviously, you know, we're going to do some things in all different phases of the reimagined part. Um, and, but we're not going to focus so hard on that, that, that it takes away from getting our football team ready uh, to play early on in the season. Coach, can we talk a little bit about the other side of the ball, the defensive side of the ball? I noticed, uh, particularly in your draft, you took a lot of corners early. Any, any particular reason? What can we expect on that side of the ball? Well, I, I, you know, in terms of the way we're going to play defense, we got corners. We have to have corners who can cover, and teams are normally going to line up with three and possibly four wide receivers, and and we've got to have depth at that position. So I, I think the the important thing is 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 finding pass rushers, and number one, and finding cover people. And uh, we 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 made cover people certainly the priority in the secondary part of the draft, which was a phase within itself. Well, Coach, your season kicks off uh, Sunday, February 9th uh, in New York, uh, 2 p.m. game. Just give us a quick, you know, what does Tampa Bay Viper football look like? Well, as, as I said, um, you know, we're not going to be out there. We want to show uh, a passion for the game. We want to be efficient. Um, certainly, we want to be explosive offensively, and we are hope that we can, but we, we need to protect our quarterback and you know, weather could be an issue and, and being able to run the ball effectively will certainly be, be part of that. And, you know, defensively, again, it's it's showing our passion for the for the game, playing smart football, running to the ball and making plays when we can make make plays. But uh, number one is being a smart, disciplined football team early on in the season. You know, more teams go out and they lose games uh, rather than win them. And uh, if you can avoid not losing games, you got a better chance of winning early on. And that doesn't mean we're going to play close to the vest, but we're going to work to play smart uh, football and try to find some identity as we work uh, through each game. 
Well, Coach, we cannot wait to see the Tampa Bay Vipers take the field in February. Cannot wait to see what kind of football team you put together. You've got your roster. Now you can implement your strategy and go out there and have fun reimagining the game. I appreciate you guys being part of this journey. It's going to be a lot of fun for everyone. Thanks for watching and listening, XFL fans. Don't forget to tell us what you think in the comments below, or even better, hit that subscribe button to stay up to date with all things XFL. Check out some of our other videos and follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at XFL Show. This is the XFL Show is a production of Pretty Easy Podcasts.